Hi everyone, this is part one of the lecture to accompany chapter 12 in your textbook. Please read chapter 12. There's lots of information I don't have time to address. Okay, let's talk about moral, legal, and aesthetic reasoning. We often find ourselves with having to make a decision that arises from some kind of moral dilemma. The textbook mentions a few of these dilemmas, like whether a mother should either go to her daughter's softball game or to an important work meeting, or what a woman should do when she's engaged to a serviceman who's out of the country, but she realizes she has feelings for someone else, or whether a governor should stay the execution of a death row inmate who was convicted entirely on circumstantial evidence. Sometimes these dilemmas only affect us, sometimes they affect the people around us, and sometimes they have far-reaching effects. Back in Chapter 1, we discussed moral subjectivism, which is that the right thing to do depends entirely on the person, and what's good for one person may or may not be good for another person. And in the abstract, we often think that way. But when it comes down to making decisions based on moral dilemmas, we tend not to think that it's just a matter of personal opinion. We tend to discuss it, think it through, try to look at all the options, and weigh the consequences. And by doing that, we are using moral reasoning. Both deductive and inductive reasoning often use value judgments as the basis for arguments. A value judgment assesses the merit desirability, or praiseworthiness of something or someone. I might judge two movies differently. One I place a high value on because I liked it, and another I might place a lower value on because there are things about it that I just didn't like. Those are non-moral value judgments and tend to be based on taste and opinion. However, there are other value judgments that are based on morals, which is our beliefs of what are good or bad actions, right or wrong, things that we ought to do or should do, what is proper and justified. If I discover that one of my students has copied someone else's critical essay and turned it in as if it were their own work, I would judge that very negatively on the basis that it's wrong to copy someone else's work. On the other hand, if one of my students found that another student had left their laptop in the classroom and went out of their way to find out whose it was and return it to them, I would judge that positively on the basis that things like honesty and integrity are good, right, and proper. Look at these sentences. Two of them are just value judgments that use taste and opinion only. The other two are using moral value judgments. Which is which? I'll give you a few seconds. The first two sentences, Jason is the world's best poker player and Susan dresses really well, are non-moral value judgments. Neither of them has anything to do with morals and everything to do with taste and opinion. The other two, it's wrong to invade another country. And Doug, you should be nicer to your kid brother. Definitely are using morals to judge the value of, in the first instance, invading another country. This person is saying that it's wrong. And in the second instance, being nice to your brother. This argument is stating that you should be nice to your brother. Okay, same thing. Which of these are moral value judgments and which are not? Take a second to figure it out. The claims in red are the moral value judgments. So let's go over them. The first, if she had any decency, Sam wouldn't smoke around her kids. It's basically saying that it isn't a decent action to smoke around your children. The second one, maybe you thought it was a moral value judgment because you might have a negative opinion of laziness, but there's no value put on laziness in this statement, just that Sandy is lazy. 
since there's no good, bad, right, or wrong moral value put on this laziness, this is not a moral judgment. The third, saying a meal is tasty, is not a moral judgment. The fourth, though, definitely is a moral judgment, that cheating on your girlfriend is beneath contempt. So hopefully you got these right. Remember, even if you automatically put a moral judgment on something, if that isn't stated in the claim, it's not a moral value judgment. Sometimes people get confused when they hear the words non-moral and immoral. That's because the word moral has two separate meanings. It's used as the opposite of non-moral. Now, I tend to use the word amoral, as in without an assigned set of morals, but non-moral and amoral mean the same thing. Like this statement, my friend Chris weighs well over 200 pounds. No matter what your personal opinion of obesity is, there's nothing about this statement that signifies any morals assigned to it. So it's an amoral or non-moral statement. But sometimes moral is used as the opposite of immoral. An immoral act is one that is the opposite of a moral act. In other words, it's bad, wrong, unethical, unjustified. So obviously, kicking a cat for the fun of it would be classified as an immoral act. No matter how you feel about cats, it's still generally considered a bad thing to kick an animal. Here's an example that clearly shows the difference between an immoral act and a non-moral act. An immoral act would be placing a knife in your roommate's eye. A non-moral act would be placing a knife in a drawer. The first act is immoral. It's the opposite of moral, in the sense that it's the opposite of good, right, and just. The second act is non-moral or amoral, as it is an act that has no assigned set of morals to it, it's simply an action. So keep those meanings clear. Don't confuse a non-moral act with an immoral act. A moral principle is a moral value judgment that's general in nature, as in that we believe such principles apply to a society at large. When we reason morally, we usually apply a general principle to a specific case. Here's an example. It's always wrong to smoke around kids. Sam smokes around her kids, so Sam is doing something wrong. The first premise is a general moral principle. It's wrong to smoke around kids. The second premise applies the general principle to a specific instance. Sam smokes around her kids. And then the conclusion, Sam is doing something wrong. This is a moral deductive argument. You might take exception to the general principle, but the structure is correct and illustrates the way in which we often use moral reasoning in deductive arguments. Moral reasoning uses two principles that we seem to instinctively understand. Principle one is also known as the consistency principle. It states that similar cases are to be treated in similar ways. If one student is taking a quiz with the book open, then I should let the other students do it too. It's not just fair. It's actually logical to remain consistent. What applies in one case should apply in other similar cases. The second principle says that if you are treating similar cases differently, then you carry the burden of proof to explain why the cases are not really similar. So if you say a particular student can take quizzes with the book open, but nobody else can, you will have to justify that. In this particular case, maybe the student in question has a disability that the American Disabilities Act requires you make accommodations for. A few years ago, I had an instance of someone who thought I was violating the consistency principle in one of my public speaking classes. My syllabus stated that if you're going to miss your speech day, it had better be for a reason over which you had no control. And your outline needed to be turned in to me and you needed to contact me before class so that I would know that you wouldn't be there. 
On a particular day, two students were missing. One had emailed me the day before saying that she was out of town, was supposed to return that night so she could be in class the next day, but her flight had been canceled and she had no way to get to class. She submitted her outline to me online. She emailed me the cancellation notice of her flight and I told her not to worry. I'd let her speak at the next class. The other person simply didn't show up, didn't contact me, and didn't submit their outline. So, at the next class, both of the students were there. I allowed the first one to speak, but not the other one. He was very angry and said he'd been sick and I should have allowed him to make up his speech. I explained that he hadn't contacted me and hadn't submitted an outline. He actually went to my department chair to complain that I was being unfair. But, of course, after hearing my defense, my chair supported my decision. I had followed both Principal 1 and Principal 2 and explained that the cases were not really similar. Now, that example aside, sometimes people's explanations of why the cases are not similar may actually be more complicated than that. For instance, what about a baker who refuses to make a cake for a same-sex couple's wedding? They make cakes for every other couple's wedding. Why not this particular couple? Does their argument that their religion forbids it pass this test? This example shows how difficult meeting this principle can be and is something we'll discuss later in the chapter when we talk about different perspectives in moral reasoning. As in other arguments, moral arguments often have an unstated premise. And that premise is very likely to be the general moral principle that you're applying the specific instance to. The first argument, he kicked his dog, wow, that's so wrong, is based on the unstated premise that is a general principle, it's wrong to kick dogs. The next example, he promised he would marry you so he better not back out now, leaves out the general principle that one should always keep one's promises. Here are some more moral arguments with unstated premises that make the argument valid. Hey, you shouldn't say that. It'll hurt her feelings. And the unstated general principle in that argument is one shouldn't say things that will hurt others' feelings. He's only a child. Don't let him log on to all your porn sites. The unstated general principle here is obviously Children shouldn't be exposed to explicit sexual material. The grocery checker undercharged you for that bottle of wine. You should tell him. The unstated general principle here is that you should inform a person if he or she undercharges you. And finally, Ms. Jones can do anything Mr. Smith can do, and the boss is willing to hire Smith, so he should be willing to hire Ms. Jones. And the unstated general principle here is people with equal abilities have an equal right to be hired, no matter their gender. So far, we've looked at how important moral reasoning is in our everyday lives. We use it all the time. It requires deductive logic and applies general moral principles to specific cases to help us come to decisions. We also use the two principles of moral reasoning. If we can apply our logic consistently, if we treat similar cases differently, the burden of proof is on us to explain how they're different. And as we will find out in class, sometimes that's difficult because our perceived differences are based on things like stereotypes. If we can't prove that the differences are significant, we might need to rethink our positions. This is the end of part one. Please move on to part two.